Pettyheads, members of the Tom Petty Nation or casual fans, and hello mum if you're listening. In today's episode, I already get to talk about one of my favourite Tom Petty songs and one of the classics in his huge body of work, Breakdown. If you haven't listened to it yet, pause the podcast, go fire it up, then come back once you're done. That's the best way to enjoy these episodes, so go do that and I'll wait here. Dramatic pause. You're back? Excellent. Then we may begin. Breakdown has a fairly cool origin story. During a recording session at Shelter Studios in 1976, the band had recorded a version of the song and Tom was playing it for Dwight Twilley, who loved the guitar lick Mike was playing towards the end of the song. He suggested that that lick really should be the main guitar phrase throughout the song and thankfully, Tom agreed. Imagine if that lick had been buried somewhere deep in an eight-minute blues jam song solo. Phil Seymour, from Twilly's band, who was also in attendance, provided the groundwork for the background vocals, and the song started to take on a new shape. The story goes that at 2am, Tom called the band back into the studio to re-record the song based on the new arrangement stemming from these conversations. This is a good early example of Tom's willingness and good sense to take ideas from anyone, anywhere, if he felt that they would serve the song well. The new take came in at between seven and eight minutes, and I suspect that this would be the basis for the way the song was played live from there on out. Remarkably, Denny Cordell managed to find a way to edit that down to a mere two minutes and 39 seconds. I had to read that a couple of times when I was doing my research for the song, as it's so iconic and so dramatic in its feel that you can easily forget how short it is. It feels so much grander. Breakdown was also the song that early champion John Scott would push hard to DJ Charlie Kendall at KWST in Los Angeles, convincing him to go see the Heartbreakers live at the Whiskey and getting an agreement from Kendall that night to play Breakdown on the station. A quote from Warren Zane's excellent biography really captures what most fans feel about the band. Talking about John Scott's relentless promotion of the record, he says... There was no label president urging him on, no budget to sponsor his passions. Scott was working from instinct alone. He'd fallen for a rock and roll record. How true is that for most of us? We've all fallen for rock and roll records. I've been doing it since I was old enough to put Paranoid or A Night at the Opera onto a turntable. Due to the new exposure that Scott's promotion and the radio airplay that resulted from it, Breakdown was re-released and finally the band hit the Billboard Top 40. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to get John to the podcast at some point to discuss the album and what it still means to him. I'd be willing to bet that he's just as in love with it now as he was back then. So the song was re-released in October of 1977 after an initial January release, and the rest, as the old saying goes, is history. It really is incredible in hindsight that neither American Girl nor anything that's rock and roll charted, or that the entire album was basically ignored by everyone on its initial release. Okay, let's get into the actual song. Breakdown is another track that doesn't come in on the one. Stan Lynch's subdued drum part takes the lead as the song opens on the four, accompanied by Ben Mont's chilled-out organ bass line. That drum intro was usually extended live, and Stan often added quite a bit of extra sauce into it in the early days. Go to YouTube and watch the evolution of that from 1978 to 1985, and then contrast that with the way that Steve Ferrone plays it on the 40th anniversary tour, far cleaner and leaning on that backbeat snare more. The song flows like a slowed down blues shuffle stripped back to the absolute bare bones. If you close your eyes, you're instantly transported to a small smoky bar room with a low stage tucked into a corner. There would be pool tables and arguments and a few people watching impatiently for the band to start. The song leaves you hanging for a couple of bars of just drums before the guitar comes in and the bass sits unobtrusively matching the kick pattern. Guaranteed in that dive bar, as soon as Mike Campbell cuts into that iconic riff, Heads would turn, chatter would stop, and everyone would now be watching the band wrapped. The lyrics are pretty self-assured, bordering on cocky when you think about them. It's all right if you love me. It's all right if you don't. I'm not afraid of you running away. I get the feeling you won't. The not-so-subtle implication here is obviously that the protagonist is irresistible, and that sooner or later, the object of their affection is going to realise that and succumb to their own feelings. It really is a seduction song, and a powerful one at that. I think it's safe to say that anyone with any sort of musical sense about them should have known or would have known that this track was special the very first time they heard it. A couple of vocal performance that has no little amount of swagger, which matches the confidence of those lyrics, with an incredibly mature, restrained instrumental arrangement, and you would have recognised instantly that these guys were not just a flash in the pan. Again, in Warren Zane's biography, Petty, he remarks that Breakdown had as much space as Green Onions. 
The Heartbreakers often revealed who they were in what they didn't play. It set them apart. I think that's an idea I'll definitely return to over and over throughout the catalogue, as it's one thing I've always loved about the Heartbreakers. They're not afraid to rock it out and to layer songs in complex ways, but they're always at their best, I think, when they keep things simple. I can't think of a single classic Tom Petty song that couldn't be played perfectly by a five-piece band in front of a live audience. It goes back to that popular jazz saying, it's the notes you don't play that matter. That understanding of where to let the guitar lead or let the drums lead or let the vocal lead are one of the real signatures of Tom's work throughout his entire career. Alan Bugs Wydell remarked that Tom and Mike had a different mindset to a lot of up-and-coming rockers and weren't just focused on scoring as many chicks as possible. They were mainly focused on the music and Breakdown is a serious statement of intent from a new band. Ignore us at your peril. With that sentiment in mind, and listening to that vocal delivery, again it should have been obvious that this was a singer who could find the emotion or feeling in any song and inhabit the character of it. That sultry drawl in the verses sets up perfectly the power and the assertive directness that the choruses employ, so they crescendo at exactly the right time. At the same time, you now have a crunchy guitar lick kicking in, driving things home to that last affirmative line, it's all right. Jeff Girard, an old friend of, of Tom and Mike's, plays guitar on this track too, and I'm guessing that maybe it's him that's playing that distorted compliment to Mike's cleaner tone throughout and letting Mike add in a few guitar phrases here and there and really complimenting that cleaner tone that Mike employs. That really spare and minimal rhythm section again underpins the entire thing, with Ron Blair's bass just sitting on the kick pattern, giving it more depth. When you talk about pocket players, you can't look too far past Ron Blair. With Tom himself being a bass player in Mud Crutch, I imagine that those two had a really easy chemistry when it came to figuring out those bass parts, and they're always absolutely perfect. So, after a short instrumental break, we get the build-up to one more chorus, which gives way to the outro. This features the same guitar refrain and some beautiful harmonies. There are some fun stops and starts in the tracks too, if you listen closely, with Ben Mont's organ dropping out for a couple of measures here and there, and some very easy-to-miss accents on the guitars. Again, such impressive attention to detail from such an inexperienced studio band. The song fades out and you're left wanting more. When the song was played live, this is where Tom would go into an extended improvisational lyrical section with the band sitting a little more quietly in the background. The energy and passion he brought to these performances was electric and you can feel the crowd feeding off it 40 years later on a low-res YouTube clip. Go check out the performance on New Year's Eve in 1978 from Santa Monica. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Time for some petty trivia. Okay, first of all, the answer to last week's question. Everyone should have got this one, I reckon. The question was, which song, which was the most frequently played live song in the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers catalogue, was the last song he played live on September 25th, 2017? The answer, of course, is American Girl. Easy peasy. So on to the question for this episode. The Heartbreakers four song set at Live Aid in Philadelphia in 1985 followed the performance of which 27-year-old who would go on to become one of the biggest female performers in the world? Back to the song. After the whiskey gig, when John Scott went backstage with Charlie Kendall to introduce himself to the band, he excitedly proclaimed that he was going to break the Heartbreakers record nationwide. Tom's response can be forgiven, I think, especially in light of how he came to be very wary of anything to do with the business side of music. Having just come off stage, he was likely still wired and not in the mood to be bothered by promoters. He simply said, Bugs, escort these children out of here. As they were being escorted out, Scott told Tom that every time the Heartbreakers heard Breakdown on the radio, they'd have to think of him. A pretty bold statement, but one that was absolutely true and one that ended up with a well-deserved apology from Tom. During the Heartbreakers' final show at the Hollywood Bowl, Tom dedicated I Won't Back Down to John in a wonderful acknowledgement of the commitment he'd shown to the band a commitment that Tom embraced and appreciated once his initial reaction was shown to be a little unkind. Breakdown went on to become a live staple for decades and sits in that classic 70s rock canon alongside any of the great songs of that decade. It's most definitely a favourite of mine, and I can't rate this song below a straight 10. It has everything. A killer all-time classic hook, a sensational vocal performance, and the most important trait in a classic song, longevity. You'll still hear it on rock stations the world over, 45 years after it was recorded. And that's because it is a timeless classic that will never age and never get old. Weird fact for you, Jamaican singer Grace Jones recorded a reggae version of Breakdown, and Tom actually wrote a third verse of the song specifically for her version. 
It was released as a US only single in July 1980, but it didn't chart. It's actually kind of hard to listen to given the brilliancy of the original, and I don't really care for her delivery of the lyric. Okay, next week's episode will cover Hometown Blues and Donald Duck will make an appearance. If you don't know why that would be, well, you'll have to tune in to find out. Thanks again for hanging out with me, folks. Go back and listen to Breakdown and maybe check out one or two of the live performances. It's really interesting to think about what that original eight-minute cut would have sounded like. Please leave me some comments if you have anything to say about the episode and please share it with your pals. Remember to subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating if you like, and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and or Twitter, whichever is the lesser evil for you fine people. You can find me at Tom Petty Project to let me know what you think. I should also say again that I'm not affiliated or endorsed by Tom Petty's estate, and any and all views expressed in the podcast are entirely my own. I should also say thanks again to my friend Randy Woods for providing the guitar for the podcast, and a shout out too to Edward Booth for very generously allowing me to use his original artwork for the podcast. You can check him out on Instagram at edbooth underscore art. I hope everyone is healthy and happy and doing fine, and until next week, adios. (laughs) 